Hello everyone, it's me again, just doing another quick introduction to this interview I did with Jerry Rees. If you haven't listened to the Fox and the Hound interview that I did with him, I recommend that you do because this is essentially part two of it, so we're just picking up where that one left off, and this one is of course focusing on the Brave Little Toaster. So let's jump right back in. I mean, the first half of the movie is mostly just them against the elements, and then we start to bring in characters for them to be against once they all kind of band together and become that family that they... Because at first they're like co-workers who don't like each other, and then... Yeah, there's con conflicts that just uh, amongst each other. It's like a dysfunctional family that that can't get along. And even even a character like the air conditioner who's who, you know, explodes out of grief and anger and you know, is not a villain. He's like, he feels left out and he's going through uh, a, a more extreme version of what everyone else is going through, feeling like they're separated from the person they love. And he felt like not only that, but he was even left out of the, the, the bonding that they had even back in the days when they were together, because he was separated from them. He was, you know, the kid was too short to reach his dial. So he couldn't, you know, couldn't even participate back then. So he's someone that feels the angst of loneliness and being left out. And so he's not a villain. Yeah. And so they all go through and, and he goes through getting repaired that, you know, finally the kid is tall enough to reach his dolls as he's growing up and he, he repairs him and he cries a few little free on tears after that. So, uh, it's nice that we, you know, we're able to see him get the care and, and affection and, and bonding from, from the kid who he, he felt separated from and now uh is grown up and and repaired him so nice little moment to uh to to bring his his situation full cycle and you know the last thing for him is he was like blowing a fuse <laughs> and then he wake comes to with like being repaired lovingly by uh by the very one that they're seeking so so yeah that was a good good outcome for him but yeah then it's it's conflict and and just the odds like how, just how are we going to do it is more the enemy is the circumstances and the it's just how big the challenges are and how are they going to travel and they just strap the battery on it but then the battery's running out you need to how can you recharge it and you know getting the bolt of lightning and but having it explode as bold and just like just being against the just the odds of the challenge where the kind of the 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 villainy was just the villain of circumstances and the impossible odds and not a specific evil character. And then as you get into, and I, I don't know if you want to hit a specific character next, but you have things like the waterfall as becomes a, oh yeah, a villain. It's like, how, how do you get across that? But again, it's not a purposeful thing. It's just uh, an extreme thing that is at odds with their success. And so, and, and I like that. I, I, you know, I, I often tire of sort of mustache twirling villains that are like, I'm going to stop you. And <laughs> um, it, it, it felt much more natural to have it just be circumstances that were absolutely plausible, uh, be what they were up against. I guess for me, um, I, it can't always be a mustache twirling villain, but I think I'm at the point where I, I miss that every now and then. I think maybe if every other movie had something or every third movie is something akin to that, because I'm, I guess I'm getting frustrated when we don't have any because that's kind of the the opposite extreme. Well, uh, yeah. Well, you know, each story deserves its own thing, and I I found it fun to 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 take uh, in Toaster when they're sinking in the quicksand in the swamp, and you feel like they're done for, and then they're rescued by almost St. Peter's. Like your first impression of him is that he's he's like came at the last second he's the cavalry he's like he yeah. saved them and uh so you feel all happy and he's this not jovial nice guy and he's he never is a villain villain but oh my gosh it's it re, it, it is it may as well be full out villainy because he's dismembering <laughs> the appliances but you know in the world of humans that's that's a thing you do you take a part from one and you you know, if you can use that part somewhere else, you do. And so having a part shop is the equivalent to like an organ shop of like selling kidneys. It's like selling kidneys and hearts and stuff like that uh, it would be like a, yeah, it would be a hell dungeon if it was humans. And, but for an appliance going through that, it is like being trapped in hell. But it was fun playing that where you go, well, in human terms, 
he's might maybe be bending the rules a little bit for to take a purposely good blender and like take the motor out to give it to somebody else and but you know it's not like ethical uh you know line you're crossing it's just being resourceful as a parts shop guy um so to have him be just kind of happily going about taking things apart and destroying them to to rebuild other things and stuff uh it, it, you know made him a fun kind of villain because he's he's unknowing he, he isn't trying to be a villain he's just trying to be an inventive parts guy and he is and you can see from a lot of the stuff he's cobbled together it's like yeah it's, it's inventive <laughs> but but for them it's like uh monster time and and uh dismemberment and and death and you know like pulling the the cord off of something is like might as well be pulling the limbs off it's really funny because i know that that is Joe Ranft voicing him and Joe went on to work on Toy Story and, and Sid, who who is a pretty yeah. nasty little kid. Like he's not nice like Mr. St. Peter's, but I, I would not be surprised if there was some 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 sort of in- residue or influence. Yeah, I, I'm sure, it, you know, it was fun casting him in that because we were just working together and we would take turns voicing different characters as we were pitching them to potential investors. So we'd have the storyboards pinned up and you know, he'd go, huh, good boy, quadruped, you remembered your seatbelt. You know, it's like just that kind of thing. It just cracked me up. And so I just went, Joe, I'm going to I'm going to use you. It's like I'm because I, I was finding other people to cast and I went for him. I, I'm going to use you. And he was like, what? No, we should. And I said, no, Joe, I'm going to use you. And he went, really? Yeah. And so it, like to him, it was a it's kind of a big thing. And, and when he did that final scream where he was scared by the characters and uh, you know i was really like having him go for it and i think he was really exhausted after that (laughs) he felt tired after doing that and uh but uh, to me it was so fun to just i mean i love that with working with a a boutique size small team as opposed to a big studio is i was able to just uh invite people into multiple tasks wear multiple hats uh, a lot of people on the film had multiple credits because I would just invite them to do one job, two jobs, three jobs, maybe four jobs. It's like just if you can handle it, like do it. So it's like, yeah, Joe, let's do do the voice, the real voice. And then, uh, you know, I, it's like I sang the, the parts for the radio because John Lovitz was booked on Saturday Night Live. So I sang for him and did squirrel voices and stuff. And and Joe and, and Chuck Richardson threw in voices. It was our production manager. And I just, you know, we all just jumped in to participate and and Chuck even did some special effects. He's production manager, but he helped out with some of the rain effects and stuff. Uh, So it just was so fun to be able to to, you know, get out of our lanes and and just do do different things like that. And you uh, I've always celebrated that with with teams that that are comfortable wearing more than one hat. And Joe did the the clown, uh, among other voices, too, right? Yeah, well, he did the yes, the run, run, and then and then the maniacal laughs. Uh, yeah, that was that was Joe's voice. So uh, yeah, and then uh, and I did the megaphone, and I did the squirrel, and Joe. Yeah, Joe. Uh, between Joe and me, and and um, oh, who else did I have join in? Yeah, Chuck and a couple other people. But you know, we did did a lot of voices. But yeah, that was great. And and by the way, the the clown, you know, that just seemed. I know a lot of people are fixated on that. It's hard not to. I, and I and I and I I, I understand. Uh, but but I had felt if you know in the toaster's nightmare, and, and there was a psychology I wanted to get into it that it's it's just a, a happy dream remembering like the kid making faces in its reflection while it's waiting for the toast to pop up. So it's all good. But then the toast getting stuck and causing smoke and then a fire breaks out uh, and the smoke itself grabbing the kid and taking it away. I want it to be like a guilt dream where the toaster is feeling like maybe it's my fault that I'm not with the kid anymore and that we're separated. Maybe something I did. So it's, I wanted shades of a guilt dream. And then I thought, okay, if you've started a fire, who shows up? Well, the fireman shows up. Well, the last thing the toaster wants is to have water and forks and stuff put in its slot. And so uh, said, of course, uh, you know, a fireman's going to show up. And then I was, I was harking back to Dumbo and the clown fireman. I mean, I, that traumatized me when I saw that growing up. It's like, geez, the, 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 they have put poor Dumbo up on the tower and there's like fire and they have 
the, pretending to be firemen and stuff. And I was like, oh, poor Dumbo. And so I was flashing on Dumbo when I said, let's use a, a fireman clown. But then it unfolded as like the, like pouring water into a, a plugged in toaster, the, the forks digging into it, all, all these things that I thought, well, it, you know, it'd be a toaster's nightmare. That was an interesting villain because it's a, it's a villain that's born out of the toaster's own guilt dream. And in my mind, that would be a recurring nightmare that, that, that the toaster has had um, after like time has gone by and it feels like the, the, what happened to the master? Where did he go? Where did the kid go? Why isn't he coming back? Maybe he doesn't like us anymore. Maybe, maybe I caused it. Maybe something, maybe I didn't make toast well enough. <laughs> and I think maybe so that dream to me was like a guilt dream that probably could have been a recurring nightmare for, for this toaster. So, so it was a villain born out of its own guilt. That's really fascinating. I, I love that. Um, I guess the next uh, villain I have, and this is uh, unlike the sort of the, the guilt-based or the perspective flip that we have with uh, Elmo St. Peter's, we've got the cutting edge appliances who really do wish our hero, knowingly wish them harm and yes, inadvertently almost get their own master killed at the junkyard. They ab- absolutely do. They are, are They can't believe that someone would value these old out of date things more than them. And, uh, so yeah, that's, that's a direct wishing ill. I mean, they're, they're, they're the most purposeful villains to me. They're more villains than, than even the masher or the magnet because they're doing their job. Like that's their job is to mash up cars in the junkyard. That's, that would be like the equivalent of toaster making a golden Brown slice of toast. It's like when the masher and the magnet and the masher have teamed up to crunch a car and it's a little kind of cube that's carried away. That's the equivalent for them of the golden brown slice of toast. That's them doing a good job. That's not them being evil in their world. That's success. And they were made for that. They were built by somebody as, as with that function. So they're relentless and, and there does become a thing with the magnet of, of hating being outsmarted and hating being thwarted from doing its job, but it's still trying to do its job. And, uh, but I feel like the cutting edge appliances, you're, you're right, Colin, they, they, they're not fulfilling any function by trying to, you know, junk the, the characters. They, they just hate them and, and they hate them because they're so beloved by the master. So they want to do them harm. But I, I, I and, and in the small world of things, I, I took uh, Plugsy, the, the character that meets them at the door, uh, voiced by Jim Jackman. Yeah. Feel free to enter all is, you know. Uh, Terry not upon our doorstep, you know, that guy. Um, I cast him, Jim Jackman, who was also a groundling, uh, to play the character in Alien Encounter in uh, Walt Disney World. Uh, who's the worker that gets eaten by the alien. So there was a little come up and it's like Plugsy actually gets eaten uh, and, at Disney, at least used to. So <laughs> that was a fun, fun little thing. I, Plugsy kind of always stuck out to me. Um, well, first of all, he makes that great face when he answers the door. But um, yeah. the others are, for the time, all cutting edge. He is, he's a purple lamp. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's kind of generic. He's kind of like the, the what you get at an IKEA like office store or something. Just uh, yeah, he's not he's not so cutting edge. He's just generic. He'll probably last the others. Yeah, yeah. A little something a little more timeless. Because yeah, at, at the time, it's funny. It's it, it's this is the way it is with of all technology stuff though. When you when you nail down an era of technology, it's the quickest thing that becomes dated about a film. And so, you know, a lot of people look now at the cutting edge song and think how old fashioned and quaint it is. At the time the movie came out, that was all absolutely cutting edge stuff. Like the, you know, per big screen projection TVs and stuff like that was, was at the time was, was cutting edge. Uh, it's just over the years, uh, it becomes the old thing. <laughs> it's like somebody proudly showing off VHS tape. It's the latest thing. Well, you know, at one time it was the latest thing. Uh, so yes, that's kind of a funny thing. It's it's quickly become the the old fashioned scene is the one bragging about how cutting edge it is. It works really well in the movie's favor, though, and I don't know how intentional this was, but 
you know, you see that, you know, we still use toasters and lamps and the, the main five appliances hold up very well. The others, not so much. We're not using candy computers. Yes, it, it, you're exactly right. And there is something about the timelessness of classics and uh, a lot of the novelty that we get into with technology is uh, short lived. It has a, a big flash, but it's a, a lot of times it's very short lived. And, and now more so than ever, uh, you know, I, in, in thinking about toaster story, uh, sequel potentials in this era, I look at the, uh, you know, the, the plight of smartphones and my gosh, their usefulness is done in a few months. And so we, you know, we, we use them for more personal reasons than ever. It's like, we have so much like our, our home movies and our, all our contacts and, and, uh, texts and things we have with people that we know and love and all that. So it's, it's more something we hold dear, uh, as a true connection with friends and family and, and business and everything else. So, and so we treasure what it does. But boy, as a device, is it disposable? It's just people toss them in after a few months and they're not meant to be repaired or, or, or carried on there. The, in fact, there was a, I heard a whole discussion about that even a few years back when, uh, you know, iPhones were quite new and uh, mobile phones in general, smartphones in general. And there was a I, I listened to a lecture by a technologist who was saying he he was fearful that that part of the human ability to understand functionality and to repair things was going to evolve away from humans if we have the functionality just sealed up out of view and out of reach and we just toss things away when they cease to function instead of opening them up and repairing them or updating them it's just all sealed and kept away from you and you just toss it and get the next one. He's like, none of you are learning how things work. <laughs> you're, you're just uh, learning to use whatever ritual it gives you to do, but you're not learning how, how things are created. So uh, I, I think there's still a, uh, a new thing. Uh, uh, I think there's even some legislation that is looking to be passed for people's right to repair things that are at more cutting edge technology and agriculture and all different kinds of places where the people using them are demanding the ability to open up and do repairs on things. And even if it comes to software and updates of things that have a lot of technology in them to say, instead of just sealing me out of the process and having a, some company person show up to do a, an update, it's like, I want to know how it works and be able to do it myself. And, uh, looks like there's, you know, people stepping up to legislate that to make it more more of a thing. But in general, the most modern things are the most fleeting in their value. Uh, tremendous value to us for a short time. And then, boy, do they go to the junk pile. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a sad fate. And even still, that same toaster with it. So with a smartphone who, who, who fears it wants to be useful, and, and hates the day it's going to be outdated and thrown away and replaced with something new. It's fear is, is more well-founded than any of the characters in the previous film, a smartphone, because it has the shortest lifespan. And it would look at something like the toaster. I en envisioned this scene where somebody puts a uh, slice of pizza in the toaster and it melts and it shorts it. And uh, so Rob has to, fix the toaster. And uh, I had him looking up on his laptop. It's like home videos that his dad took of when he used to be a kid and he put Play-Doh in the toaster and it would, it would melt down. And his dad would have to take the toaster apart and clean it up and repair it and put it back together. So Rob now in college is looking at, you know, taking, has the, the toaster that's been damaged by the, uh, you know, the melting pizza slice in, inside of it and tells his friends yeah go go to the thing you were going to do I, i'm going to stay here and so he opens up the videos looks at his dad talking about i'll show you what to do when your kid puts play-doh in your toaster <laughs> here's how you do it and you're showing how to take it apart clean it it's amazing how many parts are inside of a toaster i i looked up a diagram of all the parts it's amazing 
And so I pictured him going through this ritual of taking everything apart, laying it out, cleaning it beautifully, putting it all back together. And that these modern characters would be looking at this and think, oh my God, it's like an immortal. It's like, we would never be repaired. We'd just be tossed. Are you kidding? It's like somebody drops us in the toilet or whatever. They don't, don't resurrect us, they toss us. And uh, here this person is taking this complicated piece of equipment, this uh, toaster, and and doing surgery on it, like taking it apart, cleaning everything, putting it all back together, and it's alive again. So it would be the like the they would consider it the immortals. <laughs> and uh, so what you're saying about the cutting edge appliances not being classic, not lasting, it's like would be even more extreme now. It's like a smartphone watching that moment would just uh, be amazed and and not in a petty way, but to be jealous of that character being able to be cared for and resurrected like that. It's like, oh my gosh, what I, I wish I was part of that world. Um, but the way they were, they're made, they're not. And uh, so it would be a sad, a sad state. So in regards, uh, I guess, on the cutting edge appliances, you mentioned the, the song and yeah, Van Dyke Parks wrote that great song. Did you give him any instructions for how to write the cutting edge song? Uh, for cutting edge, I really participated a lot with that one more than any other one. He really said he felt at, at, um, quite at a loss to to really get going with that. And so there were things like the the last list in the song, you know, the ultra nylon life of beads, all that stuff. I, I would write strings of dialogue out like that uh, lyrics and send them to him because he was like, not familiar with the terms and stuff. So I would do s strings of rhymes and calling stuff out like that. And then he also brought in some people that were uh, that were used to doing more like uh, electronic music and stuff like that to collaborate with him. So that was an unusual piece for him. So musically, he brought them in and then lyrically, he asked me to, to feed him a bunch of stuff. So uh, so we, we actually did more collaborative work on Cutting Edge than than anything else. And then and then on Worthless was, uh, he did a fantastic job on, on Worthless, but there was ultimately a, well, not ultimately, the, uh, originally, there was a song turned in where he had a, a, a done sort of a love ballad piece. And um, it just didn't connect with the storytelling uh, in any particular way. Um, but it, it had talked about it as sort of an overlay of like the sadness of them being separated and stuff. And it was the one song where I called Tom Wilhite and just said, I, I, this is, it doesn't work. I can't use this song. I need something else that's way more specific. And in the meantime, there was somebody that I knew who had, I'd worked with on another project and she was at a party and she had run into him and <laughs> she said he was kind of uh proudly talking about how he was pulling one over on this young director that he had had this love ballad that he just wanted to write. And, and uh, so he convinced him that it would be used in the film, but it was just something that he wanted to do because he, it was a song he wanted to write and that, uh, ha ha, <laughs> he had pulled one over on this guy. So um, it was shortly after that, that I called him and said, you know, I, I, I can't really use that song. Uh, and boy, did he come back beautifully with uh, Worthless. That was just like, it went from like a song that didn't really fit to a great song. So It really gets you pumped up for the finale. Yeah, that was just, it was wonderful to see him kick into gear. It was after, you know, it's like, okay, okay, I'm gonna prove what I can do now. And then over in the junkyard, I saw you, uh, I'm blanking on the channel and I'm, I'm sure when I do this video, I'll, I'll link to it because I saw you showing some of the deleted scene storyboards and I saw the scene with with Ernie the junk the the junkyard owner so it's at uh creative talent network um channel yeah, yeah. it has that. so they have um actually for two months like every weekend we had an event that was recorded and is archived so that's uh quite a quite a good uh archive there and yes that was one of the one of the pieces then that might have I'm not sure if I showed that during the Brave Little Toaster reunion. Uh, you didn't. But, uh, you you showed the part with the uh, the yawning oh, scene, but yeah, yeah, you showed the other ones. Yeah, the sleepy mole. I I think it was during yeah the the subsequent the subsequent piece that where Alan had interviewed me. So, uh, but yeah, they uh, you know I finally scanned 
uh, 2,820, I think so far, uh, storyboards. There were some that I still can't find, but I uh, have most of them digitized now. And I, I would ultimately love to cut some sequences together with the audio track so that you, you people get a feel for what it was like to have the story reel uh, as it predated the the final footage and i haven't had time to 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 put that together i you know i used to get that on vhs uh frequently where don ernst who was my editor would every couple of weeks uh for some time he would just do a vhs copy of the whole reel as it existed so it would be storyboard and then some pencil test and a little bit of color and stuff like that so the i i just when i looked in my stack of vhs's the it was just uh sadly no signal left on it it was like snow when i watched it but at least the storyboards it was the original storyboards and i just scanned those and uh so i can replicate some of the story reel stuff by putting those Does the audio I still exists well, no, it's just, I, I would just have to use the final audio. I don't have the okay. t temp audio. I would just have to use the final film. And audio. I guess for some but, of the dialogue, you'd have to re-record some to just give an idea. No, I would just use the, I would just use the, oh, well, for missing sequences. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't have any of the stuff for missing sequences. I was only talking about replicating final sequences. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would have no way to, to reassemble the, other than just showing the boards themselves. Yeah, there would be no way to give the audio. And in fact, for some of it, I aborted uh, early enough where I didn't record audio for it, uh, where I just, after the storyboards, cut them out. There was a whole bunch of things that I cut out with them uh, attempting to find their way down a, a, beside a freeway, beside a, a roadway with cars going by when they first left the house. Uh, there was... Uh, they would go out and their idea was, well, we'll go along the roadway to the city and we'll just follow the cars because they're driving on the road to the city. And they would invariably have cars pass and they'd have to stop and be still. And so nobody sees them animating. And then it's like, oh, no, it's cars coming and they would continue. And then there would be more cars or somebody stopping to do something and they'd have to freeze. And they're like, and we're never going to get anywhere. So then they decided we're going to have to go cross country if we want to make any time. So then when they were out in the woods, they could just keep going where they were going. They didn't have to stop. I don't care if a skunk's looking at me. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to freeze. It's only a human. Um, so yeah, but that took up quite a bit of screen time. And so I, uh, in recently scanning that, I realized, boy, I had, I had a lot of them dealing with the headaches of that before they decided to go cross country. And as I put it together for the final film, they don't do any of that. They just immediately got start car, cross country and you don't even think about it. But yeah, I, had, I, I had gone through the logic of that and thinking that it would matter, but ultimately it didn't matter. And it saved a lot of a lot of time in the film. So I, I think I saw you once say that Will Ryan, the voice actor, had recorded some audio or is uh, in mind for you know, uh, Crazy I, Ernie. I think I'm not sure that it was I'm not sure I got the name right. Hmm. I you know, I know we had talked to will at the time but i'm i'm not sure if it was his tracks since i even wound up not using them i'm not sure right uh, i'd have to go i'd have to go look up uh and and see i've got some old photographs of being at the microphone uh with various people and i, I remember there was somebody doing uh the voice and i looked it up and went wait a second that's not will i think hmm. that's boy we got to do the voice we got to do it and that's was not will's face so i think i got the that wrong i i know in that scene uh ernie is just kind of doing his own thing so i guess we can assume he's not aware of rob almost getting uh crushed or any of that no he just goes back in his trailer and doesn't want anything to do with them and he th thinks they're weird anyway they call him crazy ernie and he doesn't like that it's like his mom used to call him crazy and he's not crazy so I know the magnet, um, yeah, the magnet doesn't really become truly evil or truly, you know, bad until he tries to, you know, revolt against a human, which is, I assume, an appliance. No, no. Well, actually, it's he's revolting against this. Yeah, it's but it's somebody that's trying to stop him from doing his function. Hmm. So 
he's trying to get these things into the masher because that's what he was designed to do. Like humans created him, designed him, engineered him to do that function. So you have the appliances themselves like trying not to be crushed. And it's like, but I'm made to crush things and I am only good at my job if I do crush things. And my the person that owns me is going to get rid of me if I'm not crushing things well. So I have to do my job. And for them to be like getting away from him and again and again, him un, being unsuccessful with doing his task, which is to crush them. And now you have this person who's like taking them away. Like, no, I'm not going to let you crush. It's still this feeling like he's being unjustly thwarted from his, his design function in life. And, and it's like, I, I am supposed to get this job done. And here's this human that's like, they were trying to stop me from doing my job. Now he's joining them and like stopping them from doing it. But he, but he does not let Rob see him. He, he, you know, you notice that he like gets rid of his eyes and stuff as he sneaks up behind him to, to grab the appliances. And he's still trying, you know, he's trying to get the appliances crushed. He's, he's not purposely trying to kill the human. He's just like, he's just trying to take the stuff away from Rob and Rob hangs on. Like, you know, he would have just taken, he would have taken the appliances away from Rob and put them on the thing and crushed them. And, you know, he's not fooling, uh, breaking any rules because there's no, there's no shot of like an empty controller seat that's magically being steered or whatever. I mean, as far as Rob's perspective, it's just, this is being run by somebody in a control room that I can't see. And then the magnet, of course, the mag that's what magnets do. They pick up the stuff. But so he imagines that somebody's probably running this. Like he doesn't, it's not breaking a magic rule. It's not showing it him its, its face or anything. And it's doing a normal function that's doing the mashing and the magnet work. And it was going to take the stuff away and put it on the, you know, on the conveyor belt and, and crush them. Just Rob himself puts himself in trouble by not letting go of them and hanging on and dumped himself on the thing. So, you know, it didn't, I didn't have the magnet go over and try to kill the human. I had the magnet go over and try to once again, take them away from the human and the human just won't let go and puts himself in, in peril, which just shows how much Rob cares. And, and that's a moment that was not in the book and it was not in the version of the film that was being imagined at Disney back when Lasseter was attached to it and and Brian and Joe were going to start working with him. There was no final scene in a junkyard with the toast with with any master being in peril. I mean, there wasn't even that character wasn't even in the film and um, and definitely no moment where the toaster would sacrifice itself jumping into the gears. So all of that was new and uh, something that I had put in as the new invention of the story as I hunkered down with Joe and Brian McEntee and Tom Wilhite and we like shook the Etch-A-Sketch and started over and went, uh, how, how does this really work? So. So building to that moment where you have the kid who was not in the uh, the other two versions of it was now part of it and his age growing up shows how much time has passed. So that was a new thing. Um, having the reason that he had to abandon them. It's like, well, he's a kid that family moves away. He's like, it's not his fault. So that was a new thing that the book version and the Lasseter version that the studio did not have. And then taking it all the way to this person now who cares about them getting in mortal peril well he could die that finally set up a moment where i could have the main character do a moment of heroism where it earns the brave part of being the brave little toaster by throwing itself into the gears and getting crunched so it was it was just i i, I loved being able to craft that story moment where this whole time with the movie being kind of well it's it's like is this going to be a kiddie thing it's just got these, it sort of sounds like it, the title sounds like a kitty thing and you've got these cute little appliances and stuff, but with it building to that point where you have a person who could die and the appliance caring enough to throw itself in and to take the grinding uh, to save the person's life. Uh, it was nice to be able to build to that big of a, a moment and then to have the, the reward be that Rob repairs him. <laughs> you know? It's like, why don't you get another one? It's like, are you kidding? Where could I find another toaster like this? <laughs> it's all dinged up. Uh, 
but but then you know getting back to that moment where finally he gets it polished up and everything and repeats the the doing the piece of toast and making faces in the reflection while it's happening and now as a as a teen instead of a kid so it, you know everything comes back to being repaired and working but but to go through that dark moment where it's like it's all or nothing and and you know where it actually comes to a literally to a life or death uh moment and to have it save the human and earn the title brave uh it was just a nice uh nice thing to be able to get the story into that shape 